I don't understand what drives people to cheat. Sometimes it looks so stupid and ridiculous that you really don't understand why they do it. People, in pursuit of personal pleasure, are ready to destroy not only their own lives, but also the lives of strangers who did not intend to do this, and this, in my opinion, is the most terrible thing. The sunlight reflecting on the warm water accompanied by intermittent splashes as the boat's bow cut through the waves created a stunning scene. The temperature was around 85 degrees Fahrenheit with clear skies. The boat's engine hummed steadily, propelling us further from shore until the coastline vanished from sight. I leaned over the side, peering into the crystal clear blue depths, hoping to catch a glimpse of fish swimming below. A gentle tug on my arm drew me back inside the boat, where I found myself embraced by the beautiful woman holding my hand. Stacy kissed me passionately, and when I tried to pull away, she insisted I continue. You'll have almost an hour to watch the fish while I'm underwater, she said. Are you embarrassed to kiss me in front of Bob? He already knows we're in love. Besides, we're married. We can do whatever we want. Stacy had always enjoyed public displays of affection. Even from the start of our relationship, she was the one to initiate kisses, often with unabashed fervor, regardless of onlookers. She wanted everyone to recognize our bond and understand that we were exclusively committed to each other. Perhaps it was due to our origins in a small town where the dating pool was limited, or perhaps she just had a strong sense of ownership, who could say for sure. While I never lacked options when it came to dating, I also never had throngs of attractive women vying for my attention. Stacy, on the other hand, exuded a subtle allure, akin to the girl next door, albeit one living next to the Playboy Mansion. With her long, thick brown hair and striking blue eyes, she possessed a natural beauty. Her figure was just right, her breasts not overly large like those of a porn star, yet not small enough to go unnoticed. Everything about her seemed flawless, including her captivating presence as she strolled around in shorts during the summer months. Sometimes I found myself completely distracted by her. It puzzled me what she saw in me, considering I was as average as they come. Yet for some inexplicable reason, she loved me. In any case, we were both in our late twenties and enjoying a wonderful life together. I worked as a design engineer for a prominent aftermarket auto parts company in Michigan, providing us with a comfortable lifestyle. Stacy didn't need to work, dedicating all her energy to creating a perfect home for us and the future children we envisioned. We indulged in a couple of vacations each year, often decided on a whim to keep things exciting and prevent boredom or stress. While we supposedly took turns choosing our activities, it usually felt like Stacy had the final say. My interests, much like myself, are more conventional compared to Stacy's pursuits. I have a passion for cars, which aligns perfectly with my job designing aftermarket trim pieces and parts. This role not only suits me well, but also grants me perks such as discounts and even freebies on parts for my Mustang. Unlike many of my acquaintances, I'm not a collector. I typically keep a Mustang for three or four years before trading it in for a newer model. Currently, I'm driving a midnight blue Shelby GTH, although this particular model originally came in black with gold stripes. Soon after taking delivery, I had it repainted and made a few upgrades. While for me, a dream vacation might entail a trip to Las Vegas for the SEMA show, Stacy's preferences lean towards activities like skiing in Colorado or scuba diving here in Florida. As we sailed through the water, Stacy gripped my hand tightly, her smile radiant enough to rival the intensity of the Florida sun. Ahead, sitting beside the boat's pilot, Bob Markham, whom we'd known for about 11 months, we headed towards a coral reef where the diving conditions were said to be perfect. We had met Bob at diving school where we were taking scuba lessons. It was during this time that we discovered my inner ear disorder, which meant I could never dive. Although Stacy initially considered giving up diving as well, I couldn't bear to let her sacrifice her passion. Bob appeared to be a decent individual, slightly older than us at 39, and married to his childhood sweetheart. They resided approximately an hour's drive away from us in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, raising three children. Susan, Bob's wife, showed no interest in diving. Bob, though not a towering figure of handsomeness, possessed a reasonable appearance. 
He, like myself, was just an ordinary man with a family, which made me feel relatively secure about him diving with Stacy. Not that I harbored any concerns about Stacy. She epitomized the ideal wife and had never given me any cause for suspicion. And trust me, I tend to be suspicious. She was affectionate, even tempered, and always where she was expected to be. This held significant importance for me, having grown up under the care of my father. I had witnessed his gradual decline from a relatively attractive and vigorous father figure to a shattered and disillusioned individual before his eventual demise. What had caused this transformation? Was it the harsh economic conditions and lack of job opportunities? Was it the globalized and militarized state of the world? None of those. It was all due to one sandy-haired woman who couldn't keep her legs closed. I swore to myself that I would never follow the same path as my father. The woman with sandy hair, of course, was my mother. What made the situation so tragically absurd was the intense love they shared. Despite moments of separation, they'd always find their way back to each other, full of promises like, I love you, and this time it'll be different. While Dad worked tirelessly to provide for us, Mom would inevitably seek solace elsewhere, whether it was with the mailman, the garbage man, or even some wandering circus clown passing through town. Predictably, Dad would eventually discover her infidelity. Despite loving her more than anything, he refused to tolerate it and would kick her out. She'd spend weeks indulging in various affairs before realizing her mistake and returning to Dad every time. Naturally, he wouldn't take her back immediately. His pride wouldn't allow it. He'd try dating other women, some of whom I preferred over my mom, but none made him truly happy. He was faithful to a fault. Mom, on the other hand, was even worse. She'd engage in flings, but never considered dating anyone other than Dad. She'd indulge in intimate acts that I'd rather not even think about, but would never be seen publicly with anyone other than him. If it weren't my life, it would be comically absurd. If it were a movie, I swear I wouldn't watch it. Growing up with these experiences instilled in me a deep-seated distrust and a strict no-tolerance stance towards cheating. I was determined not to end up in a mental institution, consumed by depression and obsession over any woman, regardless of her attractiveness. While love is a beautiful thing, I refuse to lose myself to it. This marked our third trip to Florida for diving with Bob. We had established a comfortable routine and had grown quite familiar with each other. I would rent a boat and they would dive while I entertained myself with books, videos, or games. Upon their return, they would share underwater photos and stories. Afterwards, we'd return to our hotel, where Stacy would passionately pursue me. Although it wasn't particularly enjoyable for me, I endured it because of my deep love for Stacy. However, this trip was going to be different. I had a surprise planned for her, something that would enhance her enjoyment of the trip. It was a bit costly, but well within our means. In fact, I had managed to save some money by opting not to charter a first-class dive boat this time, so the cost would be about the same as usual. I had some concerns about our captain, though. He gave off the impression that he might resort to slightly shady tactics to earn extra cash. While not physically imposing, he seemed rather cunning. What's got you grinning? Stacy interrupted my thoughts with another one of her passionate kisses. She teasingly brushed against the front of my shorts, eliciting an immediate response. Are you already plotting all the naughty things you want to do with me later? Leaning over me, I could discern her arousal through the fabric of her bikini top. She was clearly turned on. Want to sneak below deck for a quickie? Before I could respond, the boat came to a halt, and the captain descended to check on the anchors. He signaled approval with a thumbs up before disappearing below deck presumably for a nap. Bob came over and began organizing his equipment. Hey, Steve, do you know what's under the tarps at the back of the boat? He inquired. Yeah, that's the surprise I've prepared for you guys, I replied, attempting to conceal my excitement. What surprise? Stacy interjected, gripping my arm. You never mentioned anything about a surprise. Are you keeping secrets from your own wife who adores you? The three of us headed towards the stern of the boat close to the diving platform. Once there, I started removing the tarps covering my surprise. In fact, my surprise had two parts, and they wouldn't discover the second part until after their dive, perhaps not until later at the hotel. It depended on how well things went and how I felt. 
As I unveiled the surprise, their gaze fell upon two aqua scooters. Their skeptical expressions indicated they were less than impressed. Wow, exclaimed Bob. What do we do with those? What are they? They're aqua scooters, Bob. Remember last time we were here? You guys mentioned wanting to cover more ground and see more underwater. Well, these will allow you to do just that. Simply hold on and squeeze the control handle and it will propel you through the water much faster than swimming. The batteries last for about 45 minutes. You'll get a warning signal at 50%, so head back when you hear it. If the batteries die before you return, just press the purge button and it will release its ballast and float to the surface for us to retrieve later. Neither of them appeared particularly excited, but they agreed to give the scooters a try. I was confident that once they experienced the speed underwater, they would appreciate the scooters more. I believed that after trying them out, they would never want to dive without them again. However, I also considered another aspect, my love for speedy vehicles. I enjoyed maximizing the horsepower of my Mustangs, but speed didn't matter much to Stacy. She drove a car I wouldn't be caught deed in. Whenever we attended car shows, I felt embarrassed when my friends talked about seeing an attractive woman getting out of a Toyota Prius. Perhaps Stacy didn't prioritize speed, even underwater. As Bob descended into the water, I observed Stacy closely. Somehow, even with her diving gear on, she managed to look good. While most people looked awkward in their equipment, Stacy effortlessly turned it into a fashion statement. Passing the blue scooter to Bob, I noted its weight, knowing it would feel nearly weightless underwater. Stacy embraced me, pulling me close for one of her kisses that always left me breathless. She kissed me as if it were the last time she would see me before a dive, just like before we hit the ski slopes together. It was her way of expressing that if anything happened, she wanted me to remember her love. She smiled, donned her mask, and gracefully descended into the water. Passing her the red scooter, I flicked on the power switch. I love you, she uttered before submerging. Once she vanished from view, I dashed to the bow of the boat and retrieved my iPad from my belongings. It had served as entertainment during our journey until we ventured beyond the 3G range a few miles offshore. Though now devoid of internet access, it still offered games and other diversions. Recently, I had installed a special new app on it, part of my surprise for Stacy. Surprising her brought me immense joy. She was paramount in my life. Sometimes I could almost fathom why my dad endured the turmoil with my mom repeatedly. Note the almost. The day was stunning for a boat outing, with warm temperatures and refreshing ocean breezes. I ventured into the galley, grabbing a sandwich from the cooler. With about 45 minutes until their return, a quick snack was in order. While tuning the iPad to the desired frequency, I indulged in the flavor of Canadian maple turkey breast. A sip of wild cherry Pepsi accompanied my gaze at the iPad screen. Suddenly, a piece of sandwich lodged in my throat, causing me to cough violently and lean over the side of the boat, retching. Some of the sandwich and soda shot out through my nose as I coughed violently. The sensation, akin to what people describe when talking about heart attacks or life-altering events, paled in comparison to my current agony. Clutching my chest, I collapsed to my knees, pounding on it with both hands, inadvertently toppling a table on the deck, spilling my tray, soda, and sandwich. The captain rushed back on deck, visibly concerned as he noticed me holding my chest. Sir, lie down. I'll fetch the first aid kit. We have a defibrillator on board, he urged. To hell with that, I snapped. Raise the damn anchors and take me back to shore, now. But sir, your wife and your friend, he started. Throw a dinghy overboard for them. They'll manage. I insisted. The quicker we return, the better your bonus will be. Despite his struggle with leaving two individuals stranded at sea, my assessment of his character was spot on. For the right price, he'd bend any rule, leveraging his concern for my well-being. How substantial a bonus are we talking about, sir? He inquired with a grin. It hinges on your post-return actions, your discretion, and ability to keep silent, I replied. What do you say to 5,000? I'd comply with anything you desire, sir. However, regarding the bonus, perhaps we could stop at an ATM for cash. Checks are cumbersome, and bank transactions can raise a suspicion, he suggested, smiling as he began hoisting the anchor. Don't forget the dinghy, I reminded him. 
Almost as an afterthought, he tossed a small package resembling a pillow overboard. Before it splashed into the water, he tugged on a connected cable, causing it to expand and transform into a small rubber boat. Securing it with a buoy, he swiftly started the engines and we departed without a backward glance. I hurriedly packed our personal belongings and Stacy's into the bags we had brought aboard. My heart raced so loudly, I feared it might burst from my chest. Collapsing into a deck chair, I pondered the uncertain future ahead. Perhaps you should stroll around, sir, to maintain blood circulation until you receive medical attention. It's advisable to keep the heart active, he suggested from the wheelhouse, eyeing me intently. It seemed he suspected I'd suffered a mild heart attack and sought to flee ashore out of fear, unaware that I was leaving my beloved wife and friend behind, relying on his return or another's rescue. I was unfamiliar with his theory. From what I'd learned about handling a heart attack, the protocol always emphasized seeking immediate medical attention and keeping the individual calm, quiet, and lying down. However, it didn't matter in my case because I hadn't experienced a heart attack. What I went through was equally serious and life-changing, but it was more of an emotional injury than a medical one. It had taken us 90 minutes to reach the diving spot anticipating a two-hour stay. With a return trip of the same duration, we should have been back around 6, 1 p.m. As it turned out, we had only stayed for less than half an hour and were making better time than expected on our way back. Taking all of this into account, I carefully planned my next steps. The captain's eagerness for the bonus was evident as he managed to trim nearly 20 minutes off the return trip. Immediately upon docking, he approached me. Shall I escort you to the nearest hospital, sir? He inquired. No, just to the nearest bank. I replied, leaving him puzzled but fixated on the word bank. Now on to the second part of securing your bonus, I began. I understand, sir. You want me to return to the area and swiftly retrieve your wife and friend. I just need to refuel, and I'll be on my way, provided you can manage to get to the hospital independently. I've arranged for someone else to pick them up, I fibbed. Your task is solely to take me to the bank for payment. After that, I need you to erase any memory of our encounter or chartering your boat to me. He appeared suspicious and started to speak, but it seemed that money trumped any ethical concerns, so he simply nodded and we headed to a small bank in the marina. An hour later, I had checked out of the hotel and was waiting at the airport for my flight back to Michigan. The moment I surfaced from the water, I sensed trouble brewing. Scanning the horizon, I found no sign of any boats, including ours. The only vessel in sight was a small rubber life raft about fifty yards away. Behind me, Stacy Martin emerged, spluttering, expelling water and her mouthpiece. Despite the scuba gear and her soaked hair, she managed to maintain a stunning appearance. I harbored a deep-seated animosity towards her. From her perky nose to her upbeat demeanor, from her enticing figure to her firm buttocks, I despised every aspect of her. Hey, Bob, where's the boat? she asked cheerfully. Responding would only invite argument, prolonging interaction with her. So, I opted for silence and swam towards the raft, fatigued and burdened by my heavy tanks. As I pondered the whereabouts of the boat for the umpteenth time, I heard a noise. Stacy had activated her aqua scooter for propulsion, swiftly racing towards the life raft. I begrudgingly acknowledged her cleverness, realizing I hadn't considered that option. Starting my own scooter, I trailed after her towards the raft. Upon reaching the raft, Stacy promptly discarded her tanks, allowing them to sink to the bottom. She cautiously maneuvered herself onto the raft and reclined. Following suit, I also shed my tanks. Considering it's a survival scenario, her husband's financial capability to cover insurance penalties for the lost tanks crossed my mind. He's genuinely a decent person, I pondered as I settled into the raft. Fortunately, the raft was adequately equipped and spacious enough for three or four occupants. Though not overly roomy, there was sufficient space to avoid proximity or contact with Stacy both of which would have induced nausea at that moment. I began assessing our situation. 
With the sun still high in the sky, we had a couple of hours before nightfall. The warmth of the sun ensured we wouldn't freeze, but staying on the raft until dark might bring some chill. Exploring the pockets inside the raft, I focused on the one nearest to me. Bob, any idea where the boat is? What's happening? Stacy inquired. At that moment, I struggled to contain my frustration. How would I know where the boat is? I was down there with you, I retorted sharply. Should I magically conjure a boat? Let's take a moment to gather ourselves and figure out what's happening. Stacy simply shook her head and began searching through the pockets on her side of the raft, while I did the same on my end. In total, there were four pockets, with two containing a first aid kit and a flare gun. Another pocket, held three small bottles of water along with some dried fruit and meat, while the last one contained a small radio, more akin to a walkie-talkie, which we hoped could help us contact the boat for rescue. I was still grappling with the situation. This marked our third diving expedition together, and we had never surfaced far from the boat before. Despite using scooters this time, which had taken us further away, I was confident we had retraced our path accurately. Even the GPS homing feature on my watch indicated we were back at our original position, or at least very close to it. Considering our options, two conclusions emerged. Firstly, something might have happened to the boat, although if it had sunk, we would have noticed wreckage during our dive. Secondly, they might have abandoned us, which seemed improbable given Steve's devotion to his conniving wife. He would go to great lengths to please her, so their departure couldn't have been voluntary. If they had indeed left us behind, it likely wasn't by choice. Perhaps they had been attacked, potentially by the modern-day pirates we've heard about, or there might have been an emergency on board that necessitated their return to shore. The fact that they left us the raft supported this theory. If they were under attack or hijacked, they wouldn't have been able to spare the raft for us. I felt reasonably confident that I had figured things out, so now all I had to do was wait for them to return to shore and send someone back for us. I estimated it would take three or four hours for help to arrive. With no other options, waiting was our only course of action. As I glanced around, I noticed a bundle secured to the inflated edge of the raft. Upon untying it, I discovered it was a small blanket. Wrapping it around myself, I attempted to rest. The exertion of diving and the stress of our predicament had left me weary. What are you doing? Stacy inquired. It'll be at least three hours before they can return for us, I explained it. I'm exhausted, and there's nothing productive we can do in the meantime, so I'm going to try to nap. What's going on, Bob? Care to enlighten the rest of us? She retorted sharply. I don't know what's gotten into you, but we're in this together, and sharing information could be beneficial. We're not in this together, and I have no desire to share anything with you, I replied tersely. But from my perspective, they must have encountered some kind of problem or emergency while we were underwater. Something urgent enough that they couldn't wait for us to surface to handle it, hence leaving us the raft. Given Steve's character and his attachment to you, I'd wager he'll dispatch help for you promptly. It took us ninety minutes to get here, albeit without rushing. Assuming they maintain a similar speed back, maybe even a bit slower if there was a mechanical issue, we're looking at a three or four hour wait. And like I said, I'm exhausted. With that, I pulled the blanket back over me and attempted to drift back to sleep. I made a mistake. It took nearly 24 hours before we were rescued. Interestingly, a charter boat from the same company stumbled upon us on their return journey. We were severely dehydrated and sunburned, and we had nearly frozen to death during the night. Sometime after midnight, I felt Stacy trying to roll over near me for warmth. I reacted poorly, and things went downhill from there. Get away from me, you! I yelled at her. You have your own blanket, so use it. Go to hell, jerk! She yelled back. I'm never diving with you again. I'm glad you finally realized it because they don't pay me enough to ever see you again, I screamed in reply. Then a few minutes later, I discovered that she had drunk all of the water. To even the score, I ate all of the food, 
which consisted of just two small packets containing slivers of dried meats and dried fruit. I felt foolish for consuming it all at once when morning came, and we had nothing left to eat or drink. All I could do that day was sit there and try to avoid looking at the woman who had cost me my dignity and self-respect. I despised her. What bothered me the most was that she couldn't comprehend how I felt about her or why. I'm not wealthy. I'm not exceptionally attractive or talented. Heck, I'm not even that intelligent. I'm just an average husband and father. There's no way I could ever attract a woman like her, even in my wildest dreams. I don't know how her husband got her. He seemed to be an ordinary guy like me, but she loved him as if there were no tomorrow. Nearly every word out of her mouth was about him, and it sickened me. That woman simply didn't deserve him, as attractive as she was. We spent most of the day either ignoring each other or snapping at each other. And until that boat showed up, there were only two thoughts occupying my mind the entire time we were stranded together in that raft. First and foremost was a continual hope that I would reunite with my wife and children, expressing my love to them and dedicating the remainder of my days to proving it. This longing surpassed even the sensations of hunger, thirst, dehydration, and sunburn in intensity. Coming in a close second in both intensity and persistence was the urge to grip that person's throat tightly and continue squeezing until I was completely drained of strength. The arrival of the boat not only saved her life, but also prevented me from acting on that impulse. Once aboard the boat and en route to land, Stacy and I swiftly distanced ourselves from each other, taking opposite ends of the vessel. She made a beeline for the bow while I headed towards the stern. She seemed poised to leap off the moment we docked to seek out Steve and ascertain what was troubling him. This revelation came from the captain, who also informed us of another surprising fact. Contrary to our assumption that the boat had been dispatched to rescue us but had somehow gone astray, nobody was even aware we were missing. Shockingly, the captain of the chartered boat we had been on had returned early the previous day, taking some time off after a successful gambling venture. Though there was mention of a passenger with a suspected heart condition, whom the captain had ferried to shore for medical attention, there was no follow-up on the individual's condition. The focus seemed to be on the captain's gambling triumph rather than any concern for the passenger's well-being. I hoped fervently that Steve had reached a hospital capable of aiding him. Deep down, I knew that only a crisis would sever his ties with that self-absorbed woman. It was a harsh truth. Even the most genuine individuals can be ensnared by someone utterly toxic. For Steve's sake, it seemed the best outcome would be for Stacy to meet a swift end, perhaps by accidentally falling overboard upon docking. While he would undoubtedly be pained temporarily, he could eventually heal, preserving his essence and cherished memories. As for myself, I resolved to catch an early flight back to my family, vowing never to leave them again. Standing at the bow of the boat, I must confess, fear gripped me. The captain's incomprehensible words hinted at something gone awry with my husband. Despite not having eaten for a day, a foreboding sensation churned in my stomach, signaling an imminent shift in my life. Please, God, let him be safe. I'll do anything, I silently pleaded, scanning the horizon for any sign of land. Even with the boat's brisk pace, it felt agonizingly slow to me. I felt I could swim faster. The captain lent me oversized pants and a shirt, leaving me still barefoot, but I resolved to find shoes or sandals at the hospital. The nightmare of the past day faded, only to be replaced by a more harrowing one. As anyone would attest, watching a loved one face a life-threatening ordeal is even more agonizing than experiencing it oneself. Except for Bob's unexpected transformation into a difficult person, my experience on the high seas wasn't as terrible as it could have been. I couldn't comprehend why he chose to behave erratically, despite our kindness. But dwelling on it was futile. This marked the end of Bob's diving ventures with me. We had covered his hotel stay, airfare, diving gear, and more, not only this time, but also on the previous two occasions. We did it out of goodwill, thinking he couldn't afford it. 
Admittedly, Steve's inability to dive with me played a role, and he insisted I shouldn't dive solo. However, finding another dive partner wouldn't have been a challenge, and I would do so in the future. Right now, my priority was Steve's well-being. My love for him surpassed anything else. I prayed fervently that his heart condition wasn't linked to our diving adventures or our time at sea. The thought of him suffering due to something I enjoyed was unbearable. Upon reaching the docks, I disembarked from the boat promptly upon its halt. Despite the charter company's provision of a doctor for our examination, I declined their offer. However, I permitted the doctor to apply some kind of cream to soothe my sunburns, insisting on knowing which hospital Steve was admitted to. I was informed that there was only one hospital in the vicinity, thus he must be there, yet it was suggested that I retrieve some clothing from my hotel before proceeding. Considering the hospital was en route to my hotel, I acquiesced. Upon arriving at the hotel, I was taken aback by a series of surprises. Approaching the front desk, I encountered a woman who seemed familiar, her smile suggesting recognition. Are you returning so soon? She inquired, seemingly confused, perhaps mistaking me for someone else. No, I require another room key. My husband is hospitalized, and I need to gather some belongings to visit him, I clarified. After an altercation, the manager reassured me that Steve had departed the hotel the previous day and was escorted to the airport for his flight home. Despite the manager's sympathetic understanding of my situation, the only assistance he could offer was the use of a phone. I attempted to reach Steve on his cell phone, but to no avail. Perhaps he was unable to answer. Left with no other options, I contacted my parents and requested they purchase a ticket for my return home to resolve the situation. The hotel kindly provided me with sandals from their gift shop and transportation to the airport, considering our frequent stays and significant expenditures over the past nine months. Another surprise hit me as I waited in the airport lounge for my flight. After over an hour of waiting, just as the boarding call was about to happen, Bob suddenly appeared. I stood up and went to sit near him, thinking that perhaps his earlier strange behavior was due to the stress and fear of our situation. Yet, he remained aloof. When I approached him, he stood and moved further away. Disregarding him, I focused on more pressing matters. My father had clarified Steve's actions for me. To him, it made perfect sense. With Steve's heart condition, every moment was crucial for his survival. Why risk his care at a lesser facility in a small Florida town when he could choose between two of the world's leading hospitals back home? He could opt for either the renowned cardiac care center at the DMC or the similar team at the University of Michigan Hospital. Hearing my dad's explanation, I realized two things. He was likely correct, and Steve's condition was more serious than I had realized. We entered the aircraft and soon took off. Throughout the flight, I struggled to relax. Peering out the window, I felt a familiar sensation reminiscent of being on a boat. I couldn't shake the feeling that I could probably reach our destination faster by flapping my arms than the pace we were flying at. Upon landing, I scanned the area for my dad and eventually spotted him conversing with a vaguely familiar man holding a sign with my name on it. Initially, I assumed he was there to escort me to the hospital to visit Steve. However, he guided me to a conference room just outside the airline terminal. I recognized the room instantly, having been there before for meetings with out-of-town clients through Steve's company. As I entered the room, I was taken aback to see Bob, the jerk, heading in the same direction. It wasn't a spacious room, and we ended up seated at the same table. We both opted for the silent treatment, pretending the other wasn't present. My father sat behind me, which was comforting. I knew I'd have at least one friendly presence to help me navigate whatever was to come. What came next was a petite, nerdy-looking woman who handed manila envelopes to both Bob and me, while a smaller card was given to my dad. Stacy Martin, you have been served, she announced to me. Served what? I quipped. Lunch would be nice. I didn't eat much on the plane. The nerdy woman simply rolled her eyes and walked away, muttering something about stupidity and bust size. Bob, sitting across the table, seemed distressed by the contents of his envelope. He glanced at me with what seemed like murderous intent, but remained silent. Then he hung his head, and though I couldn't be certain, it sounded like he was crying. My dad opened his envelope to find the most beautifully crafted card I had ever seen. It seemed Steve had personalized it just for him. Despite its somber tone, the message was heartwarming. 
It expressed Steve's appreciation for the relationship he shared with my parents, portraying them as anchors of stability and family in his life, treating him like more than just a son-in-law, but as a son. This made me wonder if the situation was even more dire than I had initially imagined. Perhaps Steve believed he was facing a terminal illness. I peered into my envelope, only to find it empty, filled with nothing but a stack of useless papers. Why didn't I receive a card? I pondered silently. My father glanced over the papers, then back at me, shaking his head. What's going on with Steve, Dad? I inquired. There's nothing wrong with Steve, my father responded calmly. He's filing for divorce. He's what? I exclaimed, jumping to my feet just as the man who accompanied my father at the airport entered the room. That's when I recognized him, the man who coerced me into signing that agreement when I married Steve. I despised him for it. His subtle hints about the consequences of infidelity or divorce had nearly dissuaded us from getting married in the first place. Stacy, Bob, he began. I demand to speak with Steve, I yelled, right now. I'm sure you're curious as to why you're here, the man continued, unfazed by my outburst. Per my client's instructions, we will now watch a brief video clip. This video will shed light on recent events. Afterward, each of you will have 10 minutes to present your explanations. Steve may choose to accept or reject your explanations individually or collectively. He may accept one and reject the other, or vice versa. He reserves the right to reject both or accept both. He will enter the room once the video starts, but neither of you are permitted to speak to or touch him in any way. Any attempt to do so will result in automatic rejection of that party's explanation. Is that understood? Both of us nodded in agreement. Any questions? he inquired. Bob raised his hand, reminiscent of a schoolchild. The man acknowledged him with a nod, prompting Bob to pose his question. What are the consequences if he either accepts or rejects our explanations? If he accepts your explanation, you can return to your wife and kids, hopefully living happily ever after. If he doesn't, a duplicate of the file you hold and the videotape will be delivered to your wife before you arrive home. Despite his sunburn, Bob noticeably paled. The room's lighting dimmed, though not completely. A flat screen behind the man flickered to life, displaying a video. It depicted me, Steve, and Bob, seated at a table, raising beer glasses in a toast. There was footage of me and Steve sharing a kiss. I recognized it all. It was from our previous trip to Florida. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until it transitioned to some personal home videos of me and Steve, along with snippets of Bob's family at a cookout we had invited them to. I felt a surge of resentment toward Bob, though I couldn't deny that his kids were adorable. It made me contemplate starting a family with Steve. The video then shifted, becoming grainier as it transitioned to underwater footage, yet strangely familiar. It depicted me being propelled by my aqua scooter, and damn, I looked good. Despite the graininess, the footage was remarkable, with vibrant colors that almost suggested the videographer had been right there with us. Who filmed this? I inquired. It was Bob, responded a voice I recognized as Steve's. Bob had an underwater camera attached to his aqua scooter. I figured as we got older, you might want to show our kids or grandkids some of our past adventures. Then the video showed me lowering my scooter and approaching Bob. When the scooter bomb sank to the seabed, the camera angle adjusted to show both of us. I went up to Bob, took off his respirator, and kissed him. As I watched myself, silence fell in the room, and the oppressive feeling that I had been experiencing all day intensified. Both Bob and I knew what was going to happen. My complete betrayal of my husband was captured, and it looked terrible. After the video concluded, the room brightened to its full intensity. As my eyes adjusted, I noticed the varied expressions directed at me from everyone present. Bob seemed accusatory, as though I had wronged him. The lawyer wore a smug, I told you so expression. My father appeared visibly shocked, but it was Steve's gaze that stung the most. The man I loved, the one I had envisioned spending my life with, regarded me as though I were insignificant, a mere object devoid of emotion or love. Steve began to speak, remaining seated, but revealing signs of concealed pain despite his efforts to mask it. I was stunned. Prior to entering the room, I hadn't grasped the extent of what I stood to lose. I suppose you all view me as rather cold for how I've handled this, Steve started. But in truth, nothing could be further from reality. 
I'm in immense pain right now. The video I witnessed shocked and wounded me so deeply, both physically and emotionally, that several people I encountered thought I was having a heart attack. Indeed, my heart did suffer a blow, Stacy, and it was because of you. His gaze bore into mine as he spoke. I believed our life together was wonderful, loving you more deeply than I imagined possible given my past. I truly thought you felt the same way. But Stacy, you understand my family history better than anyone. My father, despite not being a fan of the Eagles, suffered from love. He spent his life devoted to a woman incapable of fidelity. Despite numerous chances, she repeatedly betrayed him. I believe my mother loved him in her own flawed manner, but fidelity was beyond her. She tried, yet cheaters inevitably repeat their actions. Each betrayal chipped away at my father until he was a shell of himself, consumed by his capacity for love and forgiveness. Steve's words offered a glimmer of hope. Perhaps amidst this turmoil, he would grant me another chance. I am not my father, he declared. Unless one of you can provide compelling reasons otherwise, two marriages will end today. I refuse to endure what he did, not for anyone. Although I'm hurting now, I'll heal and move forward. Sooner or later, I'll find someone else. His words trailed off as my thoughts overwhelmed me. This was suddenly grave. He couldn't simply replace me. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him. Every marriage faces challenges. Surely he wouldn't discard what we shared for something so trivial, not even a fleeting affair. When I returned to awareness, I struggled to breathe, but Steve continued speaking, his tone icy. The clock is ticking, he stated bluntly. Well, I suppose I'll start, Bob began. Firstly, I want to express my sincere apologies. I never intended to cause harm to you or anyone else. I've been tormented by guilt since this began. I didn't instigate it, and I had already decided to stop diving with you guys. I also assumed you were aware of the situation, or at least that's what Stacy led me to believe. However, on the boat, I noticed how you held her and gazed into her eyes, and I realized that someone who loves her deeply wouldn't want to share her. I don't have eloquent words or convincing arguments to justify my actions. Frankly, I'm not even convinced that you shouldn't inform my wife, although I'd prefer if you didn't. Perhaps you could allow me to tell her in my own way and time, because eventually I will. The guilt will consume me until I do, but I hope to approach it in a manner that might give me a chance to salvage our family. He drew in a deep breath and resumed speaking. Steve, you're an exceptional individual. Despite having financial means, you remain genuine, just like myself. You're not some pretentious person pretending to conform. I admire the career paths you've taken and wish I had made similar choices. I regret not excelling in school and missing out on those opportunities. Joining the dive class was more than just fulfilling a dream. It was a lifelong desire that financial constraints had always hindered. My enrollment was a collective gift from my wife, family, and a few friends who pooled their resources to give me a glimpse of my dream. Without their generosity, I could never have afforded it. Despite working over 50 hours a week, it's barely enough to cover the mortgage and necessities. We lead a modest life with few luxuries, but we find contentment nonetheless. However, I now feel immense guilt for not living up to the sacrifices they made for my happiness. I'm willing to undergo any test, whether a lie detector or otherwise, to prove my honesty. I never pursued or approached your wife. In fact, I tried to avoid her. Yet, she made it evident that she could easily find someone else to dive with who would comply with her wishes. Perhaps the exhilaration of exploring the underwater world momentarily overshadowed the discomfort of compromising my values. But lately, this guilt has been gnawing at me. Before we even resurfaced from our last dive, I had already decided to quit. That's why I behaved rudely towards Stacy after the dive and avoided her beforehand. I'm genuinely ashamed and remorseful for my actions, and I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to make amends, regardless of your decision. Once Bob fell silent and leaned back in his chair, the room lapsed into quietness once more. All eyes turned back to me. Steve, I began, rising from my seat and making my way toward him. I had hoped to embrace him, to reassure him that we could somehow resolve the situation. But a single glance from him halted me in my tracks. It's not as it appears. Well, maybe it is somewhat. But I wasn't thinking clearly. We all have our breaking points, moments when our rationality slips away. For you, it's those damn Mustangs.
How many times have we gone to those shows and you've lost it? Remember that blonde who trailed you at the Hin Show in Chicago? Or the Asian woman at the Nopi Show? And what about the woman with the orange and green Mustang at the Woodward Dream Cruise in Detroit? They all wound you up so much that you ravaged me afterward. So, yes, I have my breaking point too. There's something about being submerged, not in a shower or bath, but deep underwater, that drives me wild. I can't help but act on it. I moved closer to him, sensing he didn't pull away, indicating some understanding was sinking in. I understand you care for me, Steve, and I realize this situation has pained you. But you must know, those moments were the only times I've ever been tempted to betray you. I can't explain it. Our sex life is great even after a decade. I desire you every time I see you. Yet, being underwater ignites an intense arousal in me, and you can't be there with me. If you want, I'll quit diving. But remember, like your passion for car shows, each time I returned from a dive, we shared some of our most passionate moments. Last night, just like every other time, you would have struggled to stand afterward. I would have taken everything from you until there was nothing left. You're the only man I've ever loved and ever will love. This is just a quirk of mine. I'll give up diving. This switch won't flip again. I know it will take time for you to heal, but I believe we can move past this and find happiness again. Isn't our 10-year history worth one mistake? It's the only one I've made, I promise. You've always done your best to make me happy, so please forgive me for this lapse. I know I've hurt you, but I wasn't in control. It won't happen again. If you truly love me as you say you do, as much as I love you, then please grant me another chance. For a moment, silence hung heavy in the air until my gaze shifted to Steve, and I noticed a single tear trailing down his cheek. Bob, perhaps we once considered ourselves friends. As you've mentioned, he began, his voice strained. But that can never be the case again. Whenever you cross my mind, all I'll see is you underwater with Stacy. There must be consequences for that. However, I'm not blind to the fact that your heart wasn't truly in it, as the video showed. They say men can't be raped, but what I witnessed was painfully close to it. You can destroy the documents in the file. I won't pursue legal action, nor will I inform your wife. I'm not your judge, Bob. It's not my role to exact punishment or dictate your choices. Yet, I do have a suggestion for your penance. Don't confess to your wife either. You mentioned the burden of keeping it from her would weigh on you, so let it. Revealing the truth would only cause her pain, and she doesn't deserve what I'm feeling now. They say the truth sets you free, but in this case, it would only alleviate your guilt at her expense. Your punishment is to live with that guilt gnawing away at you. Thank you, Steve, Bob said, as he rose and strolled away slowly. Steve then turned to me, gesturing for me to join him at his table by the screen. He took my hand and embraced me, followed by a long, passionate kiss. My response was typical. My nipples hardened and my arousal heightened as he held me close. However, something felt off. Running my hand over Steve's pants, I noticed he wasn't becoming aroused. Stacy, you made some compelling points, he said. Before you spoke, I was so angry that I was prepared to simply cut you a check according to our prenuptial agreement and walk away. But your words, both logical and emotional, resonated with me. When you mentioned the crazy switch and how we all possess one, you struck a chord. You were spot on about many aspects of me, my passion for Mustangs, my excitement at car shows. But what you missed was that even in those moments, it was you I shared that passion with. Sure, there were other attractive women at those events, but you were the only one I desired. You were also right about my love for you, and how I always strive to make you happy. But Stace, that's all I had to give. I couldn't give any more, no matter how hard I tried, and I suppose it wasn't enough. As he spoke, he held my hand, but then gently released it. You've chosen the wrong person to try this with, considering you know all about my parents and their troubled relationship. Some of the things you said sounded just like my mother, but I refused to follow my father's footsteps. I've witnessed firsthand that cheaters will always find a way, no matter the circumstances or excuses. Unlike my dad, I won't sacrifice my self-respect for love. He kept giving my mom chances until he had none left. I loved you deeply, perhaps as much as he loved my mom, but our path can't be like theirs. Initially, I planned to settle this with a check, 
but now I'm considering using the video evidence to challenge our prenuptial agreement and give you even less in court. I was shocked by Steve's words, tears welling up, but he remained stoic as he stood up, preparing to leave me. You once said my Mustangs were my Achilles' heel, and for you, it's water. Well, I see you as some sort of H2 ho, and I can't stay married to you. I loved you, Stacy, but unlike my parents, I refuse to believe there's only one person for me. I'll find someone else." Steve left the room, leaving me alone with my father, who remained sitting, shaking his head. A few months later, we ended up in court, where I had to settle for half of the agreed amount. This meant that I would have to look for a job, but there were few opportunities for high-paying jobs in our small town. I lost everything. The man I loved, my comfortable life, my home, and even the respect of my parents. The worst part was that I couldn't get back at Bob without risking my reputation. Although I was going to tell his wife about it, I was warned that it could lead to an underwater video appearing on the internet. Now I have to watch every single woman in town compete for the love of the man I love. I single-handedly destroyed all my hopes and dreams of the life I dreamed of, underwater.